even if they don't like the company, even if it doesn't fit what they're looking for, they're going to come back the next week because that next company might be. Welcome to Partner Path, a podcast that unpacks the venture capital and growth equity ecosystem from a junior perspective. Young entrepreneurs and investors have already had a massive impact on the industry, having started unicorns and launched billion dollar funds. We discuss these success stories and more by sharing perspectives and advice from some of the industry's most prominent role models. This podcast expresses our views as of the date published and does not represent the views of and is not endorsed by any company for which we work. Today we are chatting with Brett Perlmutter, founder and CEO of Bullet Pitch. Brett started Bullet Pitch at the age of 21 while attending Middlebury College. Bullet Pitch is a newsletter with thousands of investors, founders, and operators reading weekly. Welcome, Brett. Thank you. Let's go back to your days at Middlebury and what sparked the idea to start Bullet Pitch. Well, for starters, it was cold. It's funny. I don't usually tell the story this way, but I think I'm going to this time because I think it'll be a fun little spin on it. When I was must have been a freshman at Middlebury. I remember starting to become quite interested in the VC space. And I remember getting on the phone with an alumni from Middlebury. And we were talking about what it would take to break into VC. And one of the things he told me was as a college student, I think he ended up working for maybe six or seven different VCs throughout his time in college, which was super impressive. But what he told me was, you know, Brett, one of the things I used to do is I used to find really good deals. And I used to send those deals to VCs. And I remember being like, that is brilliant because you're basically making yourself useful. And so I get off the phone with him and it occurred to me and I was like, well, wait a second, right? And this is not necessarily the whole thesis for why Bullet Pitch exists or why it started, but I was like, what if I did that? But instead of doing that to one VC at a time, what if I just did it all at once? And if I did that, it would almost be the kind of thing where it becomes a media property that scoops publications like the TechCrunch and the Forbes and the Fortunes of the world who so often focus on companies that have already raised money, right? So it's the classic TechCrunch article, right? This company just raised this amount of money backed by these investors. And the thesis was, well, hold on a second. Why is no one covering companies that are in the process of building, right? I mean, you have all the podcasts, right? We're on a podcast how I built this, right? How success happens, all the things that already happened, but no one's necessarily talking about the things that are happening. And so between that conversation with that alumni and kind of this thesis of reading the publications of the world and realizing that there was a huge opportunity to just say, well, I'm going to start something that focuses on companies that are actually in the process of building. Because if I do, who's going to read it? Well, investors will, right? Because whether you're an analyst, an associate, a partner at a VC, an angel investor, Investors are looking for deal flow. And so the thesis was one, provide investors really great companies, and then two, actually do high level diligence on those companies. And chances are we could get a lot of investors to read this thing, right? And so I started doing this, and I think the real unlock was probably a few months in after this started. It was very slow in the beginning, but all of a sudden I started getting founders reading this, right? And this was the real, oh my God moment, because it went from just investor to wait, founders are reading this and founders want to apply to be featured, right? Which ended up blowing up the whole media property because it became a two-sided marketplace, so to speak, right? Investors read because they want to know about great deals, potentially get in on the deals. And founders read and they say, wait a second, how do I get my company featured on the platform, right? And that's kind of the impetus for how it started. And was your goal at that point still to break into VC? So... It's funny because now I say this where it's like it went from trying to break into VC to now trying to literally break the traditional way that VC operates. But yeah, I would say at the time it was me just trying to find right and in the beginning. I didn't have founders applying. Right. I had to do what every good analyst does. Right. And it's funny because most media properties don't operate like venture firms. Right. They get stories that come across their desk. But for me, it was like, well, I'm just going to operate like any good analyst would and I'm going to start researching online of where company, right? What are, who are the founders in stealth on LinkedIn? Who's raising on AngelList, right? And I would literally go through what everyone else would go through. And I got really lucky with the couple first few where I think we scooped TechCrunch by almost a month for the first one. The second one raised a pretty good amount of money, I'd say probably two or three months after the feature. And so it was a good, strong starting point. But in the beginning, I was finding companies like any good analyst would. As I started to develop that muscle, 
I then had the added bonus of saying, well, wait a second. Now I've got inbound. Again, just like any VC would, though I would argue that you know some VCs probably get more inbound than others. And today, our inbound, I was just going through the pipeline actually last night. So we have about 700 companies that I still have to go through, right? So insane. But at the time, it was like, well, I'm operating like any traditional VC would, where I have inbound and I'm outbound, and hopefully we're going to find really great companies. So yeah, it went from raking into VC for sure, and I'm not quite convinced where exactly it happened, where I went from breaking into VC to trying to kind of break the traditional norms of it, but, but somewhere along that path it did. So at what point did something click where you went from cold outbounding, hoping that founders would respond, to getting an influx of inbound emails from founders? So it wasn't one of those, I think, overnight moments, right? Where it wasn't like one day the pipeline was just full of companies. I think that it was a slow burn for sure. There was one specific moment that I can think back to where I realized, and it's not necessarily that things clicked in terms of deal flow, but things clicked in terms of, I really might have something here. And we had, I remember vividly being on the phone with, with James, who's the founder of Jibby Coffee, and we were going to feature this company and we ended up featuring the company. And within the span of probably two or three hours, the inbox just exploded. I had all these investors reaching out saying, hey, I want to meet Jibby. Hey, I want to meet Jibby. Hey, I want to invest in Jibby. And we probably helped them raise a pretty good amount of their round. And I remember pretty vividly, like, this was not something that I asked them to do, but the founder of Jibby ends up putting out a LinkedIn post and he said something along the lines of, Jibby raised more money in the last two weeks from the bullet pitch feature than we had in the previous two months. And I remember this thing going, I didn't ask for it. And I'm reading this, I'm like, oh my God, I can really help founders change the trajectory of their company. I'm going to keep doing this. I'm going to keep going and I'm going to do this faster and more efficiently and figure out ways that I can keep adding value to founders because this is working. And it's adding value to founders, of course, but it's also adding value to the brand because that just became solidified, right? I don't know how many people liked it on LinkedIn, but enough where it was probably got a few thousand impressions. People were like, what's bullet pitch? And how are they doing this? And why should I be following along? And they did. It's a really fascinating way. And I like how you framed it like a marketplace because that's really what it is. But I, I think as you start to refine, I'm curious to get your thoughts on like what what qualities maybe it'd be helpful to cover. What qualities of the pitch and content that's covered do you think are particularly helpful? And are there any founders that have maybe wanted to show more or less of their company or how have you kind of refined the content that you highlight and how has that changed over time? So what I like is that you refer to it as content because it really is. And I think if you actually look at the venture landscape, and maybe this is my opinion, maybe this is the world's opinion, but if you look at companies like Andreessen Horowitz, they're great investors, 100%, but they're fantastic media companies. They understand how to tell the story of a founder. And so when I was going through and figuring out what the format would look like of Bullet Pitch. The first thing was first where I had previous experience in media and I understood that people want things that are digestible. They want things short, concise. It doesn't matter how sophisticated of an investor you are. You want to be spoon fed. And so that was part one. The simpler I can get this, the more basic I can get this. And if you actually really dig into the format of Bullet Pitch, it's actually pretty scientific, formulaic almost, where every bullet point's one sentence. It starts with the setting a scene, which is essentially what is the problem, but in a story format, right? We eat stories up. Tell them a story. Okay, what's next? Well, what does a company actually do? No one wants a 10 paragraph essay of what the company does and what their solution is. But what they do want is one sentence. So I give it to them. And then if there are confusing points in the sentence, what I do is I ultimately say, okay, well, I'm going to refine the sentence and break down what the key terms are. That's second. The next thing, and I'm doing this all off the top of my head, but I've written so many of these, I obviously know our format. We do almost an analogy, right? So this is the Airbnb of X, right? I try to stay away from maybe that one because you could use that for probably like half the marketplace companies in the world. But in general, like this company relates to this. So this is another way you could think about it. It almost seems silly. It's like, why am I dumbing it down so much? But because people are reading it so quickly, some things might go over their head. And when there's that like aha moment, right? They're like, oh, I get, I get exactly what this company does. Next step after that is kind of the due diligence, right? And so 
you could get pretty in depth with go with into market. I've had people be like, Brett, come on, you go focus on this more, this more, but for real, like what this actually is, is it's high level diligence, right? Yeah. So it's three things that I think are spectacular about the company and three risks that the company needs to have. It's not an IC memo. Wants. Yeah, it's, it's an intro. One of the things that is funny to me is I remember early days as Bullet Pitch was really starting to expand. Like I had founders that I would talk to them and I'd say on the phone or even during, like I would almost send them the article before and be like, just fact check this, make sure this is all good. Mm -hmm. And they would look at the risks and they'd be like, we don't have any risks, right? And this happened a couple of <laughs> times. And I think what founders don't maybe understand, or at least the, the best ones for sure do, and most of the ones I work with day to day now do, but it was funny because early on I remember having this weird moment where founders would be like, this, we don't have any risk. It's like, if you're a great company, you have risks, yeah. right? So that was a weird one in the beginning as I was trying to figure out, it's like, okay, well, I'm writing on your company, but I'm gonna tell the world three things about your company that I think are maybe not gonna work. Yeah, It's pretty extraordinary how most founders have gotten on board with this because they're like, yeah, of course I, we have risks, right? I can go all day. Yeah, And then we do who the founders are, which is you know pretty important, X, Bain, McKinsey, whatever. And then from there, comps, what, their similar kind of competitors are, who they're backed by, and then why the company differentiates from the competitors and why I think it's a good company. And that's it, right? And it sounded long of me just explaining it, but the read top to bottom, I mean, you both read it, probably a minute and a half, maybe. You probably skim it in less. Some people I know, they literally read, they go right to the sentence, they go right to the comps, and they go, this is interesting or this is not. Maybe they check out the market size and the, and the diligence, but it's really this kind of simplistic format that's worked really, really well to the point where I'm actually, I'll get inbound from founders wanting to be featured and they will write themselves into bullet pitch. So they will quite literally <laughs> give me the format and they will insert their company into it and be like, will you feature me? Which is pretty awesome. The fact that like, and I actually have a friend who is an analyst at a, at a firm and he said he literally uses the bullet pitch format when he is going through companies at the beginning and he wants to tell the partner about what the companies do. He just like writes like four bullet pitches that day. And I think it's awesome. What's the criteria for sorting through the noise with inbound? Because you probably have to set some There's boundaries. a lot of noise. Um, and there's a lot of companies. So I think I actually have a great tweet lined up for this morning, which is I actually think worth noting. Um, and this is silly, but I actually think it's really true because there is a lot of noise. One of the things that we actually sort through and like credit to Alexis, who is our CTO, who is an unbelievable technical mind. We have one of the, this is random and this is not obviously the thing that decides it, but I have it sort through Docsend versus Google Drive. And it's really amazing how you'll find the best companies actually put their decks in the Docsend proper versus just they throw it on a Google Drive, right? And it shows experience of founder. Now that's a little weird thing that like no one would really think about, but I found it massively effective in terms of getting rid of a lot of the noise, right? Because some people have this like PDF that they sent and it's like, what, what is this, right? Versus like the founders who are really kind of refined and locked in, typically the one with docs. And like, that's like a weird little tidbit, but it's true. It's because they want to track who's a viewing it. They want to track, right? And if you were a founder, yeah. I feel like, I, I mean, I am one, right? I want people looking at my deck, of course, but I want to know everyone who's looking at the deck, yeah. right? I don't want things getting sent around to random people. So. That's a small little one, but it, it's significant. So if our listeners are, or if our readers are listening to this, like that's a little hack. <laughs> but I think beyond that, there are two specific things I really look for in these early stage companies. One is a company being mission driven and one is founder market fit, right? And those sound really broad, but it's actually incredible again, how much you can sort through based on those two things, right? So when you have companies that are not mission driven, they look like an idea, right? They look like a founder who's so attached to an idea that the second something goes wrong, they throw their hands up in the air. They go, oh, I guess it's, I guess I'm done. Mission-driven founders don't build an idea. They build a concept, right? They build it to a mission. And so if one thing doesn't work, they're not gonna stop because they have a mission in mind, right? That's really powerful. And you see a lot of these companies who are, whether they're the GPT rappers, a lot of these companies you can tell are ideas that are kind of swung. And sometimes I obviously need to get on the phone with the founder to understand that, but it's very obvious when you see a mission-driven company versus, see, right? There's a real problem that the founder wants to solve. Yeah. And then founder market fit is huge too, right? Like when you ask a founder, it's like, oh, like, so, you know, you work in nightlife, right? Or like your company's based in nightlife. What's your experience? 
And you've got the founder who's like, yeah, I literally grew up in a bar. I grew up in a dive bar. And then you have the founder who's like, yeah, you know, I worked for McKinsey and it's like, well. I like are, going out. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> those are two very different things. And I think that oftentimes the founders who are built under, the problem was their own or they saw the problem so vividly that they understand exactly how to solve it. And when they start doing it, they know the right people to talk to, yeah. right? If you like going out, but you're not actually a nightlife founder, who are you going to talk to? Versus like if you grew up in a dive bar, you probably know the entire bar staff for six of the bars or that kind of thing. Right? You understand yeah. hospitality. Laura and I are thrilled to announce a partnership with Grata, an intuitive deal sourcing platform. Keep missing out on private market deals? Ditch the Rolodex and get Grata. Grata's AI-powered platform provides access to accurate data, deep insights, and time-saving workflows that help get more deals done. And it's trusted by over 500 firms and 3,000 deal makers, including myself. I've personally used Grata in both my deal sourcing and diligence workflows and would recommend their tool to any investor across private equity, growth equity, corp dev, or investment banking. You mentioned that you have hundreds of, of folks that are, that are obviously trying to be featured. I think you have, what, tens of thousands of, of subscribers and readers now. I'm curious to hear maybe a little bit more about the journey of, of where it goes and how you decide how to expand bullet pitch, at least on the, the content side of things. Ideally, you will be able to include more of those hundreds of folks that want to be highlighted, but at the same time, you can't dilute the impact or the effect, right? So it's always kind of a trade-off. How are you thinking through that trade-off? So scarcity is critical, right? And I think that we've seen accelerators like Y Combinator who have become a bit commoditized and they're still the best in the game because they're so focused on getting as many people through the door. But at the same time, they get to take a lot of spets, right? Because this is a media company and because there's actually this really cool thing that's happened, we're like, and I haven't done this math, but based on the amount of applications we get a month and based on the four companies I feature a month, our acceptance rate's pretty damn low, right? And so because of that, I think the scarcity is actually pretty powerful because we know this psychologically, scarcity equals people wanting to be on something, right? People associating and investors saying, wow, he's only giving me the best of the best. Now, that being said, the unlock with bullet pitch is truly this. Media yields deal flow, period. Every Tuesday, we send out that newsletter. I know we're going to get flooded with deal flow. Right? I'm going to see founders who see it on social. I'm going to see founders who have been reading now for maybe a couple weeks or months, and they say, I want to be featured. Right, And so it's this really cool thing where I know without a doubt that on Tuesdays, we will get the most amount of deal flow. What is the expansion? Well, to me, it's pretty natural. I think video is key. I think video is everything, and I have for probably about the last two years. And obviously, I started this as written content, right? And I'm on Twitter, and I'm on LinkedIn. But at the end of the day, video is key. And I expect to start doing video content and, and really anything that yields deal flow. Because the more eyeballs that see the brand, the more applications we get. Maybe piggybacking up off that thought is, obviously, you understand what the founders are looking for. How do you understand what the audience is looking for? How do you know if you're covering too much, too little? You have that, that point of feedback in the newsletter that's like, would you invest? And I think that's a really interesting concept, although it's extremely simple, right? It's just a yes or no. I would invest. I wouldn't invest. All of a sudden you get this percentage where 57% of people would invest in this company and 60% of people would not invest in this other company. And it's kind of this early read of your audience, which is made up of investors and founders. And although it's just this very binary button, I think it's a really interesting idea of pulling this mass of people on, on their thoughts of a business. So I'm going to take you one step further. It's actually not a binary button because when people say yes or no, it takes them to a page where they can leave a comment. The comments I get, <laughs> some of the top investors literally in the game right now, like they make their opinions known to me. And I don't know if it's because they know I'm behind it. I don't know if it's because they just have these really strong opinions that they really want to talk about, but it is unbelievable to me. We did like, I think maybe back in September, we did like this AI law startup. The amount of lawyers that came out of the woodwork that read bullet pitch, right? <laughs> this is never gonna work, or I love this. And it's really cool, and I actually can't coin this term, but a good investor friend of mine did, and he basically described bullet pitch as first look, last look, right? 
I see the company come in and I go, that's really interesting. And I have the last look at the company because I see what happens after the feature, which is investor interest, which is polling, obviously, which is pretty cool. Yeah. But it's this really unique thing where I kind of get a look behind the curtain of every company we feature. And so I say this in a way that's not testy, but sometimes I like to do it a little bit. I'll see a company and I'll be like, that's really interesting. I would never as an investor invest in that company, but I see something there. Let me play around with it. And so I like whether it's like maybe a company that's a little bit more leaning towards a feature versus an actual product. And I'll say, okay, you know what? Let me feature, let's see what happens. And I've had this happen before where people are like, wow, this is super interesting. I really am excited to see how this company continues to build out. And I've gotten, I hate this company. And to me, that's everything because I know my audience so well that I'm at a point where like, whether it's the ads we run, right? Like I was on the phone with an advertiser yesterday. I know exactly what's going to hit with our audience every single time because I know them so well because they give it to me on a silver platter. So what like hits with them? How would you describe it? Well, one, they like short. Two, they like concise. Three, they hate features versus products. That is the number one thing where when we highlight a company that leans towards feature, right? And like this is early days too and maybe the deal flow wasn't as strong, but it's like I did this one time and like this company actually did fairly well because they were like building into something more, but they were like a Chrome extension, right? Oh my God. And like, by the way, I would probably say the same thing, but like really interesting concepts. The revenue model was fascinating. They ended up doing pretty well. Our audience ripped it apart and I love it because it's not like, like it was a 25,000 person I see. A hundred, well more, but like, it'd be one of those things where like, it shows that they're engaged. Right, they come back for more, right? And that's the best part is even if they don't like the company, even if it doesn't fit what they're looking for, they're gonna come back the next week because that next company might be. And that is the power of this media company. It just doesn't go out of style because every company is different. And you might hate the next 20 companies, but you're never gonna unsubscribe because that 21st company, never unsubscribe, obviously people do. But that 21st company might be the one if you're an analyst that potentially your fund invests in and starts your career off. If you're a partner and you're kind of just like getting tired of deal flow and then you see this company, you're like, oh my God, that's amazing. And we've got the whole suite, which is pretty cool. So people come back. Is, is there anything that you tried that didn't work in the early days? Good question. We're going to pivot this from like the venture conversation to me being a media mind, right? Because this is like, I am a media person at the end of the day. And one of the things that I was really creative with early on was just growth hacking bullets, right? And I think you even had a question somewhere in here of like, how did you grow the thing? And I think there were about a million and one ways that I tried and some were absolute failures, some were absolute hits, but there was one specifically that I thought was like this great idea. And it was like kind of, it like kind of worked, but then like looking back on it, I was like, what, what am I doing? This was probably eight months into bullet pitch, we'd started to gain a little bit of a following, you know, some of these like pretty critical investors. And I was like, wow, like I look up to some of these people, they're reading this thing now that I write. And what I did was I said, you know, let's have these growth scouts come. Let's have 12 college students who want to learn about venture come in and be our growth scouts where they source companies, even though we ended up not using any of the companies. So failure in that and short foresight there, right? Because like, what kind of companies are they going to source? Well, they were sourcing them from their college campuses, right? And some of these companies were like, not really off the ground. And so that was kind of weird. But the, the fun growth hacky thing that we did is all the growth scouts competed every month to get people subscribed, right? This is like a fun <laughs> little like thing. It's like sourcing. <laughs> yes, but it was like, how many people invent? The problem was they didn't know anyone in venture. Right. So they would like go to their friends and be like, subscribe to this. And so their friends would subscribe and then they would be like, I don't even know what venture is. And they don't subscribe. Right. So it was like, but that was one of those things where I was super confident and I would do that again, 10 out of 10 times, because like, I just kept thinking of every possible way to do the growth. Right. And, and some of it worked, right? Like, I mean, we were explosive on Twitter, especially I think like last year around this time, there was days where we were doing a thousand new subscribers a day, right? Like crazy just figuring out how to growth hack this thing, right? And and there's no one way to do it, but doing that was a blast. And so like, or have there been any things that like have been failures? No, because every, like the core product has stayed, not the same, but it's stayed 
fairly linear. The things that I've done, whether it's different companies, whether it's growth hacking, all that stuff, some of it's going to fail, some of it's going to work, but the ones that fail usually just teach you how to make it work the next time. You're a media guy, right? Mm -hmm. And there are, and beyond that, I would say you're a media influencer. You're very influential. I don't, I don't know about that. <laughs> I don't think I'm... And I know you're from LA, right? Anyways, I'm curious to get your thoughts and compare a newsletter following, which is what Bullet Pitch is, to people or various programs or, or, or institutions that have more social media following, right? Like comparing a Twitter or a TikTok following to a newsletter following. I guess I don't want to put words in your mouth, but there's a lot more intent theoretically behind it. There's more you can do with interactive things like the buttons and stuff like that. I'd love to just get your thoughts and, and hear if you've com tried to compare that in your mind and how you value that following relative to other ways of media influence. So this is exactly why I don't see myself as any sort of influential perk, because at the end of the day, right, the brilliance of a newsletter, right? And anyone who's in the industry will tell you this. And I don't consider myself, there's a couple things I don't consider myself, right? I don't consider myself an influencer. I don't consider myself a community builder. I don't consider myself, like some of these things that like people have thrown around these names at me and I'm like, I'm a founder. And what I understand about founding a comp or rather founding company in the media space is the one thing that newsletters offer is the ability to own your audience. So in the media space today, when you tweet something or when you post something on TikTok or Instagram, right, all social media has moved away from showing content of who you follow and instead they show content of anybody, right? It's the algorithm. You're at the disposal of the algorithm, right? Yeah. When you look at the picture of a newsletter, what's amazing is let's say we sent our newsletter to 110,000 people last week, right, which is somewhere around that range. 52% open rate, they're all going to see it, right? Like I know how many people read versus Twitter. You're putting up a prayer, right? I mean, you really are. There's no necessarily way, shape or form. And the person who saw your tweet one time might not see it again for three months, yeah. right? Newsletters are reliable. So that's one. Two is data collected, right? So, and, and we, we can talk about this and we should, especially on the event side of things, right? So obviously, right? We say 2,000 people apply to be come to our event, 1,000 come, those 1,000 get put on the list. Not only do I know who they are, right? I know their name. I know how much they're raising. I know who they bank with. I know what cloud provider, all of it. And the newsletter allows me to collect data points on all these people, right? And even when you look at these founders that apply, every time a founder applies, in our database goes not only who the person is, what their company is, how much they're raising, what their deck looks like. It's data, right? And so... As a founder, I understand that the reason that the newsletter medium is so powerful is not necessarily the medium in itself, right? Because realistically, no newsletter ever, and I'm trying to think of the biggest ones like the Morning Brew, can reach the same amount of people that a viral tweet or a viral TikTok can reach. Yeah. But what you have is one reliability, two, probably a little bit more of a refined audience in terms of like, you know, stature. Going back to... Uh something that you've launched outside of bullet pitch the newsletter you've decided to launch a syndicate and so this syndicate is pooling together angel investors to invest in these startups i'm assuming some of the ones that you're featuring in your newsletter what was the impetus for that and how did you know what to do at a younger age age is just a number by the way so as i continued building the media side there were two critical things that I learned, right? And I have learned over the last, call it, two and a half years. Venture is a commodities game, right? What differentiates fund one and fund two? Well, their dollar is a dollar no matter how you split it. So the answer is honestly not much. So fundamentally, what does it actually come down to? And in my mind, it's these two things. One, how much value do you actually add to companies? And two, what kind of access do you have to deals, right? And at the earliest stages, those are two things, and there's of course other things, but those are two critical things that differentiate great investors. And the reality was I'm sitting here and I'm like, well, wait a second. I've got pretty good access 
And founders know me to add a lot of value to them, right? Whether it's obviously me running a media company or me just being the person who wants to go sit with them until 2 a.m. Like, this is like how I'm built. This is what I do. And so it was one of those things where I was like, well, wait a second. I'm a pretty differentiated investor. There's no reason that I can't start investing if I have these two things. And plus, obviously building this not necessarily investing track record, and let's date it back eight months ago, right? The one thing I did have was this track record of one, being able to build a company, but two, having the ear of a lot of investors, right? And not just institutional investors, family offices, angel investors, right? And so the thought there was, well, wait a second, I'm positioned to do this. And while most people would probably, if they were starting a syndicate, would have to start from ground zero, I've got a following, right? Let me give this a try. And luckily, a couple, you know, and, and I would say luckily because there's there's an element of luck in everything we do. But luckily, I set this up very well. I can't take credit for knowing how to do everything, right? I have a great legal team that helped me do this. And ultimately was able to set up a syndicate and start doing really great deals. And I mean, I'm looking back, like the first two deals we did have now both been marked up 4X already, right? And it's been six months. And, and so ne- not to say that like, Yay, it worked because it never works until you get the exit, right? But the one thing that is proving out was one, this is a commodities game, right? I could be just as good as some of the best. But two, the access that I have and the value that I add to these founders make them really excited to work with me and give me allocation deals, right? And so because of that, it's been a very natural progression with the investment side of things and it's working. Yeah. But given, I guess, the risks of angel investing, has it been hard to pull together capital from angels? Because for context, some of the companies that you're featuring, it's not your traditional SaaS. We've had a mix of hardware, consumer. I'm a generalist. And what I would say is this. If you are working for a firm that is specifically niche down, you are going to look at quality deals always, right? You're going to, if you ask 99% of investors, where do you get your deal flow? They have the same answer. It's our network, right? I'm not claiming to be any different, right? I have an awesome network, but I have one thing that I know not about them to have, which is I've got quantity. I've got a lot of deals that I see, right? Probably more than most because I got a media company. And so because of that, I think that there's two ways to invest. One is you are super niche specific. You get brought really quality deals in your niche and you're doing a couple of you, right? The other way is you see everything. You're like an accelerator, right? You see everything under the sun. And ultimately, you're able to cast a wide net and boil it down to a few really great companies, right? And that's how I do it, right? I see a lot and I pick the ones that I think are really fascinating, run it by our LPs who have been amazing and who believe in me and who see that I have this differentiated factor and they've believed in me and so far so good. I'd love to circle back to the thought of adding value to the founders because I do think that there is a really unique thing that you can offer to these companies having such a large following. But I will also say that there are a lot of other investors like Laura and I that are willing to stay up to 2 a.m. and and chat with folks as well, right? So how do you view the value that you can add that you think others can't? Right. Like what, what is extremely unique and how has that come to fruition in so, some of the companies? Yeah. So I'm going to give you a great example. And I agree that everyone could stay up them too. And you guys are great investors. Founders don't see me as an investor. They see me yeah. as a founder. And it completely shifts the dynamic in a way that I have witnessed where I watch a founder talk to an investor and I watch a founder talk to me and go, why do you not talk to them the same way? It's like, oh, because they don't, they're an investor. And I'm sure they get it the same way, but there's this weird, interesting dynamic where most of the time I spend is not with investors, it's with founders, because I'm building a company too. I just happen to be building a company that focuses on other companies. That's part one. Part two, and I think this is a really clear example of value add. So last week, wow, last week we threw an event for almost 2,000 people, right? Or 2,000 people signed up, we had about 1,000. I had a list of every single person, obviously, who's going to come to the event. So what do I do? Well, I download that list and I send it to every one of my portfolio companies and I say, 
if there's anyone you want to meet on this list or be introduced ahead of time, I will do it. I probably made about 50 intros headed into the event and it was massively successful for all of my portfolio companies specifically, right? Because they had the one advantage that no other founder in the room had. They knew who was actually going to be there. They knew, they texted the person before, hey, let's meet in the corner. All night, my portfolio companies, right? And, and candidly, my job that night was facilitating and making sure that they were in really good shape, right? That's not something that a traditional VC, and, and maybe they can do, but it's something that I can also do, right? That's the value. Yeah, it's a really interesting way of, of actually quantifying it, right? Because you have a lot of folks, but finding ways to make that natural introduction is really interesting. Do you want to end with a quick fire? End with a quick fire round? Just like what question? Yeah, so it's yeah. rapid fire. We'll give you four. It doesn't have to be one word, but just like kind of a snappy yeah. response. Okay. See what's on your mind. We're recording. It's like 1030 or so. So okay. maybe we'll get some bagel and coffee answers. But Favorite company featured so far? I got to say Posh. And it's because we ended up investing them afterwards. But it was awesome because I caught them so early. And Avante was on the show. Check it out. What is the next big trend in your industry? Who's it? Like me? media. We're going to see, I'm going to try to keep this short. I think we're going to see a world where influencer marketing becomes less important because, and I talked about this, we're beholden to the big companies now where if you want to play, you got to pay. And I think that the way that these tech companies can control who sees what, influencers are beholden to the same thing that we all right? And even though they have followings, the algorithm might show more of their content, but at the end of the day, a couple miss hits, they're in the gutter. So I think you're going to start to see a lot of companies to move away from influencer marketing and move towards pay to play because that's the only way you can guarantee impressions. Do you think AI will start to displace certain aspects of media? A hundred percent. But I think that the creativity behind media is what's going to stick around, right? So like, yeah, you might not need a team of 10 writers anymore. But like in terms of like format and process and like some of those things, that that's not going away. And then what's your dream company to feature in Bullet Pitch? I don't know if I have a good answer to that. I, I think that there's a... A dream, like an industry you're targeting next maybe? So, I mean, teaser. It's I'm awesome. fascinated right now with industries that are so sleepy that no one's paying attention to and that are so ripe for disruption and i'm really excited because there's a deal right now that i'm doing on the syndicate side of things that's going to end up probably on the media side of things a few months later and i'm really excited to see i mean we're going to tap down the deal first but i'm really excited to see the interest from our general subscriber base because our lps have put them off this deal because it's such a sleepy industry and this company's doing so well and so I think that one of the things that I'm really looking forward to doing over the next few months is like really digging into some of the, these industries specifically that are super sleepy and old and who is the disruptor in those industries. Can you give us the industry? Yeah. Death care. Death care. That is quite definitionally sleepy. 20 billion. Last question for you. Yes or no. Would you increase your cadence beyond 40 mils a month? No. All right. Quality over quantity. <laughs> well, this has been obviously our first in-person podcast, but such a fun conversation, Brett. Thanks so much for coming Thanks on. Thanks for having me. And looking forward to, to publishing it and, and keeping the conversation going. You both are awesome. Thanks. Thanks, Brett. 